All right, opening text. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. We read, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Let me read that again. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. The title of my message today is, How Great is Your God? How Great is Your God? We are without a doubt, not just here in America, but throughout the world, entering into some very dark times. We're on the brink of World War III, which would probably include nuclear weapons on some level. We see a catastrophic global collapse of the world's economies, including America's, that could happen within the next several weeks, bringing in a new cashless system that will literally transform the way business is done and funds are transferred. We see a major push for global government with world leaders calling for one nameless man to lead it. These are just a few of the signs we are seeing today that point to the very near start of the seven-year tribulation period the scriptures tell us about. As followers of Christ, however, we have a blessed hope we can both hang on to and look forward to, an event we at Blessed Hope Fellowship believe will take place prior to the start of the tribulation period. An event, uh, but how much of what is about to take place we will have to go through before that trumpet sounds only God knows. I think we would all agree the less we have to experience before that sounds, the better. Amen? <clears throat> but are we prepared to go through whatever it is he would have us to go through up to that time? That's a question in and of itself. Seeing what lies ahead for us in this world, it is imperative that we search our hearts and know beyond a head knowledge how great is our God? So let me ask this simple question. How great is your God? How great is your God? When we talk of God's greatness, we can certainly speak of creation that came about by and through Him, God. We can talk of how God brought judgment to the inhabitants of the earth through the flood sparing only Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And even of God's judgment falling upon Sodom and Gomorrah, sparing only Lot and his two daughters. But how about those times when he showed himself great through and by the hands of mankind? In Exodus chapter 5 through chapters 12, we see the account of Moses contending with Pharaoh regarding the Israelites and the ten plagues that was used to influence Pharaoh to release the Israelites. In Exodus chapter 13 through chapter 40, we see how God sustained the Israelites on their journey from Egypt all the way to the Promised Land, bringing forth water out of a rock causing manna to fall from heaven, keeping their clothes from getting worn over a period of 40 years. How many of you would like to see your clothes last 40 years and not be worn at all? What about the time that God used Samson to defeat the Philistines as recorded in Judges chapter 15? Or what about the time that God used David to slay Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17? What about when God used Elijah to challenge the prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel, as recorded in 1 Kings 18? 
or how God used Elisha to keep a widow's oil replenished and full as recorded in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. I'm going to go ahead and read that passage, just a few verses. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went with so she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt and you, are, and, you and your sons live on the rest. God moved. What about how God used Elisha to cause an, ac uh, an iron axe head to float? We see that in 2 Kings chapter 6, 1 through 6. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. What about the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who survived a fiery furnace as recorded in Daniel chapter 3? What about when God spared Daniel in the lion's den, recorded in Daniel chapter 6. Or even how God humbled and restored King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. What about the time when Jesus turned water into wine? John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. We read, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee 
and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. We can look through the Gospels of Mark, Luke, and John at many miracles that Jesus did. And then what about the time that God raised Jesus from the dead? As recorded in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John chapter 20. So my question again is, how great is your God? The book of Psalms is filled with statements and descriptions of how great God is. Many times, David would have to remind himself of God's greatness to handle the trials and tribulations life brought his way. Is your God as great as the God of the Bible? I can't help but think of Christians who are living under harsh regimes that, re that restrict or prohibit anyone from being a Christian, much less living and telling others about it something that we in America may actually have to experience should the Lord tarry at some point. But I picture these people meeting underground, eager to learn more of Jesus, with a yearning to see him come for them soon. <clears throat> I do not picture them sitting around a room griping and complaining about how rough and unjust life has been towards them, not to be in denial of what they are having to live under, but focused and praying for the heart of Jesus towards others and boldness to proclaim the name of Jesus to all God will lead them to despite the persecution they will no doubt suffer. <clears throat> I'm reminded how recently I've read of Christians in the Ukraine experiencing the war there and how their heart was, they were meeting and their heart was seeking for the Lord to return, but also seeking, uh, worshiping God, praising God, and seeking ways that they could promote the gospel to others. That was their focus. And you know, I could see those people, and I can even see the people in other places around the world where they are heavily restricted. I could hear them find, uh, hear them interceding for the salvation and well-being of those who are in positions of power and influence over them. How many of you know that is a biblical command for us? We don't pray for their demise. We don't pray for judgment to be brought upon them. We don't pray for them to experience hardship and death or whatever. We pray for them, for their souls for the salvation, and that God will use them according to his will. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 16, 15 through 18. Mark is writing, and he says, and he said to them, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Verse 17, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. In this passage, one of the points he makes is that for those of us who believe, one of the signs that will follow us is that nothing can harm us, even if we drink something deadly. As far as I know, I've never eaten or drank anything that was deadly. <clears throat> but as I've mentioned before, when a group of us were witnessing in a park in the town I grew up in, that we were given by some of the the bystanders that were mocking us, a piece of homemade cookie that we know was drugged. We asked the Lord to protect us, standing on his word as recorded here in Mark 16. And some of us ate of that cookie while we were there witnessing. 
and to see how in about five minutes' time, the people that were mocking us and ridiculing us and being uh, disrespectful to us, their composure, their attitude, every, their countenance totally changed to where they now became a captive audience and their jaws had dropped. Why? Because whatever was in that cookie had zero effect on us and they knew something was up. And we were able, the doors were open and we were able to witness to those people in a very powerful and profound way. One of which, one girl I remember, she was in tears, so impacted by what was being shared with her that she actually went running full steam ahead away from us because she couldn't bear to hear anything more. Again, how great is your God? Today, the church here in America and perhaps in other parts of the world are becoming more and more divided and broken up over several different issues facing them. We have Christians pushing for various socialist-styled changes in culture and government, and those who are pushing and fighting for the conflicting patriotic or American way of life and living. We have had Christians pushing for specific mandated medical treatments and others who are fighting against them. We have had Christians fighting for masks and those who are pushing back against them. Christians are getting more and more divided and splintered, and that not, ought not to be so. Christians, of all people, are to be in unity with one another. Yet it seems like we are perhaps the most divided and splintered of people groups today. My focus today is not about unity, though that is definitely a subject that needs to be addressed, but instead to ask the question, how great is your God? There are two possible reasons why I believe there is division among Christians. There may be others, but there's two that come to mind. One is that Christians have taken their eyes off of Jesus and how, <clears throat> and how great God is. And they have made this world and its systems more their home and love it too much. Both, I believe, is a result of deception. Either getting genuinely deceived or allowing themselves to believe in something that, uh, in error that tickles their ears and coincides with their ideas of how things should be despite what the Word, despite what the word of God tells us. It seems like more and more Christians view this world, more specifically this, this country, as their home more than heaven. And their thoughts, their speech, their attitudes, their behaviors, and their actions make that argument far stronger than their denials of such. You could talk to a number of Christians, and they will say that their home is in heaven, but when you listen to them speak, when you see their attitudes, their behaviors, the way they act, their motivations, their priorities, They say something totally different. Again, how great is your God? The God of the Bible, the one I serve, is greater than the COVID virus. He is greater than even the vaccines. And he is greater than any one or more individuals, no matter the positions of power and influence they may have, just to name a few examples. Instead of griping, complaining, or even debating the various things the government or this world is pushing upon us, we should be talking about the greatness of our God and those things that He has in store for us if we will just trust Him and endure for His sake. Instead of talking about the many pressures and trials we are facing, we should be sharing testimonies of how great God is and what He has been doing in both our lives and in the lives of others. If we say our God is as great as He is, 
and that he is greater than all those things that are being thrust upon us, then our speech should reflect that and project our confidence in him to those who are watching and listening to us. Again, how great is your God? Is your God great? Or is the problems of this world greater than your God? Is your God great? Or is the government of our country or of others greater than our God? Is God is your God great? Or is the economy, the culture, the society we live in, and the people who influence and media and what forth greater than your God? As we prepare for communion, I'm reminded of the three Hebrew children in Daniel chapter 3. The ones that refused to disobey God and bowed down to the golden image King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When questioned and warned by King Nebuchadnezzar about not bowing down to the gold statue he had erected, their answer in verses 16 through 18 should serve as an example for how we ought to answer those who are pushing us to disobey God and the specific commands he has given us. Let me read Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Hmm. Would that be your answer? Is that your answer now, and does your life, your speech, and your attitudes reflect that? Something to think about. How great is your God? I know my God is greater than all these things. He's greater than this world. He's greater than the world system. He's greater than those in authority. He's greater than any disease or sickness. And he's greater than any quote-unquote medical treatments for those things. He's greater than it all. Is your God greater than it all? 